Mr. Pilot, critics have said that the government is not focusing enough on other problems. There's poverty, but there's also environmental issues. What is the government doing to sustain this phenomenal growth? Well, the most important thing, I think, um, for any country, especially for a country uh, which has the size and scale of India, uh, it's important, first of all, to create an environment that is investor-friendly. For many years, we have not opened up our economy. And the last 15 years, we have seen a phenomenal growth in our manufacturing and our servicing sector. And I think that has been possible largely because there has been a very stable political and investment-friendly atmosphere in the country. Now, as the country progresses and uh, we are growing at about almost 8.5%, 9% a year, I think it's, it's, a very, it's a very fast pace of growth. Um, clearly, there are some areas where um, uh, some people say that the government has been overlooking, but I think it's, that's not true because in India we have many states and uh, the issues that you have brought up about sustainable development and you know, climate change and, and weather and environment, I think these are all the collective responsibility of everybody. So I think the Indian society, the Indian federal government, along with the state governments, is very conscious of the fact that if you grow at, at the pace that we're growing, using up resources, natural and renewable, uh, we have a commitment to the larger, larger global community. So I think the government, uh, the federal government, is, is very, very conscious of this fact. And no matter what policies we implement, whatever programs we announce, whatever development we do, there are a certain set of parameters that uh, one has to meet uh, and these are, these are standards which are set by uh, at, at global standards, you know, European and Western standards. We've, we've taken cognizance of the fact that we have to grow and while we grow, uh, we have to leave for our future generations uh, the same planet, the same country, the same climate we inherited. So I think people, especially the younger people in government and in my party, are very, very conscious of this fact. So uh, we still need to work a lot. I mean, I think uh, when we talk about growth, India and China are using up a lot of the world's energy. And in doing so, we are also uh, emitting uh, a lot of carbon dioxide and CO2 and CFCs. So we know these facts, but the, the fact is that ultimately it all costs money. So I think now the argument has come down to the, to the, uh, to, to the basics, who is going to foot the bill. And I think India uh, and this neighborhood um, will uh, not shy away from its responsibility uh, towards this commitment of, of a sustainable development. You think that uh, environmental issues are not being ignored? Because I keep hearing it again and again that the, develop that the government is not doing enough for it. For instance, water management uh, in the rural area especially, that little is being done, and yet that is the biggest problem. In terms of energy consumption, India's energy needs, three-fourths of them, 75% is imported. By 2015, 90% uh, of our energy is going to be imported. So we have tried really now to uh, change the energy mix, to shift from you know, coal and fossil fuel uh, and oil, which we import large, large amounts of it, uh, to shift it to renewable resources, uh, be it biomass, uh, you know, be it hydro, be it wind power. And now also uh, the government has really taken upon itself to uh, enhance the scope of nuclear energy production. Uh, as of now, only 3% of energy comes from nuclear source but we try to now enhance that scope so that we have a, a varied mix and uh, for growth we need energy and I think it's wrong for the Western world or the Western countries to say that well having used up 200 years of the world's resources and, and attained a certain standard for their societies uh, to really deny those facilities and opportunities for people in our part of the world but clearly the, the, glo the globe belongs, the earth belongs to everybody and as we progress we will do our share but I think we have to reach some sort of an agreement as to uh, who is at what stage of development and who, which countries, which governments can afford to pay and foot those bills because ultimately it all costs money. Clean technology uh, involves a lot of research and development. It involves a lot of scientific, a lot of uh, equipment and a lot of technology has to go in. And so who will bear that cost? And I, like I said, I think it's, uh, it's wrong for anyone to mandate that from henceforth, if you need to grow, you need to grow in a certain way. Uh, Having said that, I also think it's our responsibility to make sure that uh, we don't pollute the world uh, more than we are required to. But we have to come to some sort of an understanding. It has to be a global effort. It has to be a combined effort of, of the so-called the North and the South. It, it really can't be mandated from uh, the capitals of the Western world. So I think we can work together for this. Mr. Panda, we talk about security here. Um, obviously, investors are running to come to invest in India because of the favorable investment climate. 
But there is rebellion among the Naxalites. Jammu and Kashmir is still not quite safe. And recently there have been acts of terrorism. How to deal with this? First of all, uh, you must remember that India is of continental proportions. So uh, a trouble spot at some end of the country really has very little impact on the rest of the country. But having said that, uh, yes, we must be aware that as we become uh, a more developed country, development doesn't happen uniformly. Uh, you can measure on any parameter from 15 years ago, the number of poor people, the size of the middle class, uh, on any parameter virtually, and you'll find that India and Indians are much better off today than 15 years ago. But there are still pockets that have not developed as rapidly as they could have, and that becomes the breeding ground for disaffection. And yes, we do have Naxalites in certain pockets, and they do take the law into their own hands. And we go about it in a variety of ways. The country as a whole has uh, democracy, and I think that's the best answer to any kind of extremism. Because in a country of a billion people, we've had sustained democracy, and people feel, by and large, that they have a voice in the changes that are happening to them. And I think that is the best antidote. But you can't always leave things to, to democracy and social activism to bring about inclusiveness. You also have to have uh, protection, like you said. The Indian state has not always been very hard about this. Uh, and, and in some ways, our police are very genteel in, in tackling terrorism because they are not equipped with modern weapons. Uh, police outposts in uh, some remote areas have not had to tackle any serious crime or any serious disturbances. And so this is a new thing for them. So there is a modernization effort that is going on on a national scale where police are being modernized, particularly in, uh, in those few states where we do have some uh, extremist elements. So there is an angle of the state tackling uh, uh, any disturbances on a law and order front, but there is also a great effort to have these people included in the mainstream by providing them opportunities to come in. What about the recent acts of terrorism that doesn't seem to have anything to do with, with the, the situation, you know, um, uh, with like uh, similar to the Naxalites, I mean, the recent train bombing in the trains and so forth? Yes. Uh, some of these incidents, of course, are due to the, the troubles that we have on some of our borders, and some of the terrorist elements come from across the borders. I think one of the best things that you can say about India is that when you look at pan-global terrorist outfits like Al-Qaeda, uh, many people had predicted years ago that India would be a source of recruitment for such organizations in large numbers. That just hasn't happened. Uh, we, we either have zero or very little recruitment for organizations like Al-Qaeda from a place like India. Because even, uh, even though uh, we are such a large country with such diversity, and as I said earlier, there are pockets that have not developed as fast as the rest of the country, but everyone in the country generally feels that because of the vote, they have a say in things. And even our minorities don't fall into the trap of any kind of pan-global terrorist activities. So the level of terrorism that comes up from within the country, the level of disaffection that leads to any kind of uh, bombings or, or uh, suicide bombers within the country is minuscule, or, uh, next, to, next to zero. Uh, we, we do have problems on the borders for which we have talks going on with some of our neighboring countries to solve those problems, and I think these are on the right track. So your terrorism of the kind that's uh, bombings and so forth, you think they're manageable in India? Well, any act of terrorism is, of course, should be avoidable, should be avoided. Uh, manageable in the sense that it has not disrupted the Indian economy in a very big way, I wouldn't like to be complacent and, and say that uh, it's manageable and that we will not have any such incidents. We obviously have to upgrade our security mechanism, our intelligence system, and our preparedness for such, uh, such acts. But I think that the, the threat that there will be large-scale indigenous terrorism that will disrupt the economy in a big way is very small. Thank you.